All right, so we've we've taken a bit of a route here. And where we are ending up at, it is justification, but it is the process. It is the process of justification. And from our first meeting up until this point, it may seem like all we have been doing is going through the process. And that's true. We have been going through the process of justification, but we have been going through the setup of the process. We've been looking at the process to get to the process. And what we have found is that everything considered, what matters to justification's process is marriage. And there's something that when it comes to relationships, it's really easy to forget. And it's easy to forget loss. Said in another way, when it comes to relationships, it's easy. Relationship between male and female. I'm talking about a human, human, human uh, intimate relationship between male and female. What's forgotten is the aspect of loss or the aspect of sacrifice. Sacrifice. In order to gain the other, in order to properly court the other, there has to be a, a humbling of our person in order to let them know that they are now more to us than, than anything. And even more, when we are now in that relationship, when we, when we have the male, the female, that we know is, is, is to be with us, that sacrifice, that loss, it doesn't end. It continues and it continues to manifest in ways making the relationship more thoughtful more more meaningful, more empathic, more fulfilling. It's the same thing when it comes to the marriage or the relationship between our conversation's conscience on the one hand and our faith's intellect on the other hand. So we've gone through the process of justification by looking at terms, by looking at context, by looking at how the language of those terms and context does what it's supposed to do to help further define justification as a process, as an assignment for our human being and for our devotional character. We've, we've gone through that process and we have seen how the Bible allows us to know that this is the process of us letting go our former devotional thoughts and feelings to arrive at a more suitable for our person, for our individual person, devotional character. And arriving at this better or suited or more preferred for our human being and for our type of personal devotional conversation, arriving at such a fixture, we find ourselves in a marriage. And in this marriage, the marriage of our conversation's conscience and the marriage of our faith's intellect, we find a new arrangement going on because we're no longer married to our former devotional or religious belief. Stepping out of that, putting that aside, allowing Emmanuel, allowing Emmanuel to be our guide to the living God's devotional character, to the living God's mind, allowing Emmanuel to be the blueprint, to be the blueprint devotional character. Our faith has grown and in growing, our faith has grown to know itself and in knowing, in knowing itself, our faith has come to understand its character and the character of its conversation. And that marriage, that marriage has allowed us to know that we have a spouse. Our faith has a spouse. Our conversation has a spouse. And so in order to keep that relationship functional and in order, just as we would our natural human relationships, sacrifice and loss is in order. And what we have been reviewing is that concept or that aspect of loss, what needs to be let go of in order for our conversation to reach its highest potential. In order for our relationship to reach its highest potential, we there's, we know what we can do. We, there's communication. There's exercising empathy toward our partner. There's, there's listening. There's a whole lot of things that we can do to our physical partner that allows our relationship to grow because they're seeing we want to grow. Same thing with our faith. We have to do certain things. One of those things is loss to let our faith know that we are in it for the long haul. And being in it for the long haul, we want to give it up to its creator. 
And so this is where everything thus far that we have uh, been reviewing, you know, fits in because the spouse, our spouse, our faith spouse, our conversation spouse, they are to know one another and in knowing one another, we, because this is all going inside of us, we meaning our human being, our human being has to make sacrifices in order for that relationship to continue because the end game is our human being married to the being of our devotional character. That's end game. That's end game. That's what makes our human experience beautiful. When our human being finds itself situated next to and married to the being of our devotional character, that is end game. That allows us to know that our human experience can transcend the very troublesome or low estate that we know it to be, which is why we turn to the Bible in the first place. We turn to the Bible to get knowledge of and to escape something that we don't know how to put words to, but it's a feeling, it's an experience that we know that we need help in and with. And so we know that there is just something within the scriptures that can do that for us. We don't know what, we don't know how, we don't know why, we don't know when, we don't know where. But we know that life has led us to the scriptures for a purpose of healing. Well, the process of justification is to lead to that process of healing. That process of healing is justification, where our conversations, conscience is to marry our faith's intellect. Their marriage then doubles down and works on our human being because our human being, being naturally erroneous, now has a guide and now has a corrector, now has a spouse. And so with our human being attached to and in relationship with to eventually marry the being of our devotional character. With that being of our devotional character having gone through everything that it went through in that process of justification, our human being has a counselor. Has a counselor and has a reference guide of how it to be, of how it should be. How to be and how it should be. That reference guide being etched within the character of our conversation being the living God's devotional character. The living God's devotional character living within our conversation. This is Emmanuel, the philosophy of Emmanuel. When this philosophy is within our conversation's conscience and it meets our human being, this is what allows us to know what life and what living is. And so when it comes to this process of justification, the process within the process, it's, it's for a point. The point is for our human being to marry the being of our devotional character. The process of justification is to get the being of our devotional character ready for that marriage. Ready for that marriage. It's, it's pretty, it's, 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 it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's intricate. It's poetic. It's ridiculously poetic when you think about it. Because we have a creator that has created us fractured, absolutely fractured as human beings and knows it. But also understands that there is an assignment for our human being. That assignment is the process of justification. And so when we're talking about the process of justification, we are end game talking about the marriage of our devotional character to our human being. But in order for that to happen, our devotional character needs to be perfect, like dress. Think of a woman on a wedding who wants to look absolutely ridiculously beautiful for her husband. This is what our devotional character needs to be, needs to feel. We have to get it ready for our human being. And that readiness involves laws. It involves laws. It involves abstaining from certain practices that we have known to feel right and comfortable, which in reality are not, for, especially for our human being. It, it includes abstaining from certain habits of mind, certain devotional habits of mind. It, it, it includes abstaining from certain practices that we have grown accustomed to and certain beliefs and theories to intimately know the scriptures so that we can know that loss of not knowing to now receiving the gain of understanding. And this is what we have been discussing thus far and what the process of justification is leading us to accept and also to find comfort in.
This is your host, Linwood Jackson Jr. Checking in with you. How are you? Thank you. Thank you, family, for checking into this program. Thank you for staying tuned continually to Justification. This is a much needed topic and based on the conversations I've had with different people, whether they be pastor or lay, it is it is at this time that there is a, a need, a need to understand more of what the Bible is saying. And so I want to invite you to check out the book, Justification, of which this show is based off of. Check out this book. It is an in-depth research book based on this term justification, and it allows you, the reader, to know what you can do, what I can do, what we can do collectively to make our lifestyle, devotional lifestyle, to make our devotional lifestyle that much more better so that our human lifestyle can understand the correction it needs to make in order for the two to marry. So check out this book and continue, please continue to enjoy this program. And this is well to know to put into plain terms because we can review everything for so long. We can review everything for so long and still just not get it. We can review everything entirely and miss the point. And that's why in our, our times together, you know, we reviewed certain terms above, below, world, all of these things to just get our mind ready for understanding where we are to venture to in this journey. And we have reviewed this verse plenty of times, but right now it fits. It again fits in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, and Paul has included not, not simply just the loss or the sacrifice that needs to be experienced, but also a bit of counsel for why and when we are doing this. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, we've seen this verse since our first meeting up until now. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. We know this term now. That's why it's so cool to go through the Bible and to understand terms. Again, and be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may do what? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. So everything that we reviewed our last couple of meetings together about loss, we can now understand that the body that is to be offered, that Paul is here calling for, is not the literal body. It is the body of our faith. It is the body of our understanding. The offering up or the sacrificing of the body of our understanding is a fit offering at this point in time. Why? Because by doing so, we are risking what we think we know. We are risking our opinion with the scriptures to gain fact. And in doing so, verse 2 starts off by giving us wise counsel that we have reviewed. Be not conformed to the world. And this, this conformity, because the sacrifice is not natural or physical, this conformity to this world, this world is not natural or physical because what we are to do for it is not natural or physical. The world at hand that is mentioned in this verse is the same world that we've been reviewing in the scriptures, how the Bible defines it. This world is the world of religion, the religious world, the religious age. The author is letting us know to not be conformed, not us physically, not us personally, us our devotional character. Do not let your devotional character be conformed to the theories or the process of devotion of the religious world or age. It should Why? Because it should be a sacrifice already. It should already be a sacrifice to the living God for the living God's mind to do with it as it would. Nevertheless, as a reminder, yet and still, do not conform or offer your body to the religious world and to its philosophy to its theory, to its belief, to its opinion, to its ritual, to its policy. Instead of doing that, be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you may know, that you may prove the will of the living God and if and why and how it is acceptable. 
This is the loss that our conversation is to know. Our conversation is to know this loss because there is a goal. The goal is to know. It takes us back to Isaiah 53. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. We've reviewed this plenty of times. The issue of justification is related to a knowing or to a knowledge, to a science. And this is the science of justification. It is through this understanding that the conversation, not us personally, the body of our understanding, the body of our confidence of the living God is to be justified, is to be cleansed, is to be transformed. That transformation, plainly, Romans 1 and 2, is to occur through the mind, allowing our mind to settle on these things to arrive at a better understanding. And why? Why is it so important? Why is it so important for our devotional character to arrive at a better understanding of its own belief? Why is it so important? Well, it's so important because attached to that work of marriage, once married, there is a labor that the couple has to carry out. That couple not being anything but our conversation's conscience and our faith's intellect. Their marriage is to lead to a labor. And as we've seen times before, that labor being a labor of, quote unquote, charity. We are to know and to prove the living God's will so that the flavor of our charity can be exactly what it's supposed to be. So long as we are attached to the opinions and theories that are within the religious world, so long as we are attached to the opinions and theories of pastor so-and-so and whoever so-and-so, our labor cannot be as genuine as it should be. Our labor cannot hit as it's supposed to hit. We cannot touch individuals with, with the flavor that we are, so long as we are consuming the flavor of another mind, the flavor of another conversation. We are to flavor the age that we are living in. We are to flavor the age that we are living in. We, what is within us, is to flavor, is to color the age that we are living in with what only we can give. And the process of justification is the process of bringing out us to us. Justification is a process of bringing out us to us, which is why it's so intimate. Which is why the mind is so intimate. Which is why understanding is so intimate to this process of justification. We are to speak. We are to speak not from a book. We are not to walk around with the Bible saying, the Bible says this, so you need to be this. Bible says that, so you need to be that. Bible says this is wrong, so that's wrong. We will turn people away from this philosophy and from the words within this book if this is us, if this is what we intend to do. The Bible isn't given to be distributed as a rule of authority, so to say, to, to, to other consciences. The Bible is given as instruction to our human being and to our devotional character that through the correction given, we may have its words written within us so that we don't need to walk around with the book. We are the book. Us being the book doesn't mean that we are quoting everything that we say. It means that us being the book, we have engraved within us the principles and the philosophies of this mind that inspired it. So we're not walking around saying, thus saith this, thus saith that, thou shalt not, thou shall. That's not what we are doing when it is the Bible that is written within us. When the, when the words of the scriptures are written within us, we become read of the scriptures. Meaning that, as Paul is saying, by proving what that will is within these scriptures, we gain experience of it and can talk from the point through it, talking through it, we become wisdom to another mind hearing us. And as becoming wisdom, we become that instruction. And as becoming that instruction, we become a highlight because it then turns to, 
where did you get this from? Where did, where did you get this from? Who did you hear this from? Where did you learn this from? Your composure, where is it from? Where are these words that you're saying to me to help me through the time that I need help in? Where are they coming from? Well, that's where we then quote what is on our heart and then direct them back to the book that we got it from so that they too can gather up that inspiration for themselves. This is why the separation between the religious world and the conversation's conscience needs to take place. When that separation can take place, we open up an avenue of learning. This allows the living God to work more fervently within us as it is seen that we are more fervent toward learning the living God's devotional character. Family, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for tuning in. I want to thank you for being attentive to the message. Everything that I'm giving to you has been placed and laced onto my heart by our Father and due to its benefit in my life. I have been inspired to share it with others. And the reactions that I'm getting have been beautiful because we're all going through the same thing. We're all going through the same thing. We're all going through the same struggle. We all got the same attitudes. We all got the same everything. But it helps to know that there is a mind that crafted a wisdom who is the creator of our human being and our conversations, conscience and body. And so... You know, taking all of this into perspective, you know, it made such an impression on me. I'm thankful to you for being attentive. And I'm thankful thankful to you for caring also for your own um, human and devotional or spiritual condition. So I'm interrupting this meeting, a meeting in which I know you are being fed, to give a shout out to my sponsors. Uh, Grammarly, thank you. Grammarly, if you are into writing as I am, if writing is your life as writing is my life, Grammarly is the key to use to get your writing beyond par, beyond par. It's simple to use, very simple to use, and it's and it's very key to getting to the point of what isn't so obvious in your writing. So if you are a writer like me, publishing, um, any, any sort of blogging, anything that you do that you put out to benefit another, Grammarly is the way to go. And also the American Bible Society, Bibles.com. The American Bible Society, if you love the Bible like I do, and if you need a new Bible or just would like a collection, American Bible Society, you can find everything and anything related to the Bible on this website. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. And so there is an instance within scripture because we are to give a message and that message is to come from our experience with the Bible's philosophies, not to come from another, whatever you want to call it. It's to come from us personally. We are to personally experience, personally experience these things within the Bible so that the revelation of its philosophy can impact us, that our person can translate it into a way that another can understand it. That they then, hearing that translation, can, can pick up curiosity of it can take in what they need to take in and can transform according to that transformation that they should then have, that they may then pick up inspiration to find the source of what gave us the things to say to them or that gave us the, the spirit to do for them what we did. And so in the book of 2 Samuel 18, 28 to 30, we have King David on the run. Certain events are going down with his son. His son is taking over the throne. He's doing a whole lot. David is, is out there with his crew, not king, but usurped. And there's an individual that is running to David and that is telling David that he has word of what's gone on with the king. The king be, being his son Absalom. And so 2 Samuel 18, 28 to 30. 2 Samuel 18, 28 to 30 reads... And Ahimaaz called and said unto the king, All is well. And he fell down to the earth upon his face before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which hath delivered upon the men that lifted up their hand against my lord the king. And the king said, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Ahimaaz answered, When Joab sent the king's servant and me thy servant, I saw a great tumult, but I knew not what it was. And the king said unto him, 
turn aside and stand here. And he turned aside and stood still. And then after doing so, someone else came, overtook him, and gave the king the information that he actually needed that this individual was not there to provide. Now, we don't want to be in that situation. When we have something to say about the living God that can help another person, we don't want to come to them with a message that is, that's just half opened and, and half closed at the same time. We don't want to come to somebody hoping to inspire them with the living God's words and to have them say something back to us and then for us to be silent about what we said or to be silent about how they should understand it. Going through the process of justification, we gain the experience and we gain the knowledge of the philosophy within the Bible to the point that we can then allow, as it says in the Corinthians, be an epistle written of the living God's spirit or wisdom or mind. Being that epistle, we can speak as a letter written and inscribed. They will never, whoever is coming to us or whoever we are going to, for help, for assistance, for guidance, for, for care, we will never be told, step aside. Because the moment we're told, step aside, they're going to find another source. And that other source may not be genuine enough to get them to where they need to be, but may mislead them into a more disingenuous feeling within themselves. We have to be right. We have to be right within ourselves, and that's what the process of justification is about. It's about getting our devotional character right so that our human being can be right. A right human being will be able to relate to another misled or hurt, injured, or wrong human being. And in that relation, relating not simply as a human being, but as a spiritual or devotional creature. So we can get to the essence because we've gone through the process of understanding the essence that is within us. That's what justification is about. That's what true charity is about. Guiding as we've read, guiding as we've read from uh, in the Bible, guiding another on their journey of discovering the self of their conversation is the definition, the proper definition of charity. And doing so through the philosophy within the scriptures, not allowing the Bible to be that, that, but allowing the wisdom it gives to inspire another to take wisdom of their self. Thank you.